1 Samuel uh, chapter number 18 is where we're going to take our text. And I want to preach you a message that I believe will, uh, will help you. You know, we think about, um, we think about Father's Day. And this, this may be, you may be thinking when we get into this text, what has this got to do with Father's Day? And I'm going I'm to show you some things that I believe in the relationship between Jonathan and David that emulates the relationship that we have between our Heavenly Father and ourselves. I want to preach you a message entitled, The Prince and the Pauper. The Prince and the Pauper. Let's look and see what the Bible has to say in these four verses of Scripture. Here's what it says. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. God, help us to apply it to our life. Help us to see the typology that we will look at in the Scripture. Help us to understand the relationship between Jonathan and David and how that it grew. And Lord, help us to see it how it is that Jesus is our Heavenly Father. And I pray, God, that you just help us, Lord, to, to really appreciate uh, what it is that you have done for us. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, as we move through the life of David, and, and he, was a, he was a man that was truly blessed by, uh, by God, and we know that from our searching the Scripture, that the Bible teaches us that he was a man after God's own heart, and, and God was very gracious to David, and, uh, and he placed people in his life that was going to help him to get to the place where he was destined to be. You see, the people that was provided uh, to David was a support system to allow him to grow in his life so that one day, as he was anointed king of Israel, that he'd be able to take his rightful place. I want to reflect back on David's life a little bit and think about where it got started. We find out that he is, in the, uh, um, uh, he is anointed as a young man to be the king of, of Israel, as a shepherd boy. Uh, he was given the, uh, the mantle to, to take up and to lead the children of God at a very young age. He comes to a place, he's still a poor man, he's still a shepherd. He's still someone that uh, no one would look at as being important at all. And I want to remind you of something here. God's put a touch on your life. Don't you let the world tell you you're less than what God's called you to be. One of the most precious and profound relationships that you'll find in the Bible is that relationship between Jonathan and David. Jonathan was heaven sent to a young David. He was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, when you think about the name Jonathan, here's what it means. It means Jehovah has given. I'm convinced that when we look at this relationship and this story here that we find out that God put somebody in David's life to move him forward. God does that to us oftentimes. It's a little off of the subject matter, but can I say this here? God oftentimes put people in our life to help us to get to where it is he's called us to go. So don't overlook those relationships, but Jonathan was strategically placed in the life of David, and, and he become his friend. You see, uh, as we pass through this life, you're, you're going to make a, a lot of acquaintances. You're going to have probably hundreds or thousands of acquaintances, but there's very few of those will ever become your real true friend. Uh, friend. It's oftentimes said that at your, at your death, if you can count the number of friends that you've got on one hand, you're considered to be a lucky person. You're considered to be a very blessed person. Matter of fact, one person said this about friends. A true a friend, the first person who comes in when the whole world has walked out. That's a true friend. I heard it said this way about friendship. 
A friend is someone who understands your past, believes in your future, and accepts you today just the way that you are. That's what a friend is. And that's what the relationship between Jonathan and David had morphed into. He saw him for who he was, and he knew who he was going to be. He became his friend. I want to remind you of this here. Uh, uh, rightfully, rightfully, Jonathan should have been the next heir to sit on the throne of Israel. He was the son of Saul, who was the king. It should have passed on down to his son. But Jonathan knew something a little different. He was in touch with what God was trying to do. You see, we're, we're seeing typology in these passages of Scripture as well. Say, preacher, what is typology? Typology is when you look at one subject matter and it reminds you of another subject matter. So we're going to see some typology of the love of Jesus and, 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 and the love that he has for the saints of God through this story. You see, the saints of God have a genuine friend in Jesus Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, he's my friend. You see, as a friend, uh, we can always call on our Heavenly Father because He's always there. You see, and, uh, as we look at this story here, we find out that we're looking at a picture of the relationship with Jesus Christ in us. We see that in the relationship with Jonathan and David. We'll get there in just a few minutes, if you'll hold on. So therefore, I want to preach you that message, the prince and the pauper. So let's look at the very first thing I believe that will show us this picture. First thing I want you to think about is the unconditional love of Jonathan. There was unconditional love that Jonathan had for his friend David. Look at verse number four again. Let's take a look at that passage. And the Bible says, And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. See, these verses tell us that Jonathan removed his princely robe and he places it on the pauper. He places it on a lowly man. He puts that on him. He even gives him his sword, his bow, and he girts him with his belt. See, in other words, Jonathan was willing to lay aside the symbols of his position as the crown prince of Israel and give them to David. If you think about it here, somebody might even look and say, when they saw David that day, they saw Jonathan. He had on his armor, he had on his helmet, or he had on his, uh, uh, excuse me, his belt. He had his sword, he had his uh, robe. He even had uh, 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 everything that Jonathan had. You might would mistake him for Jonathan in that day. See, this kind of love can only be seen in and, you know, in the Bible, and we find out that that love that we're talking about is a love relationship that God has for us, too. You see, Jesus done exactly the same thing that Jonathan has done. He laid down all of those wonders and splendors of heaven, and he come to us where we were to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves. You see, we can see this kind of love also in 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 17. We're not going to look at the verse. It, it's where Jonathan reveals to David that he knows that David's going to ascend to the throne of Israel. But Jonathan is not jealous of what David is doing. He intends to stand by David, and even uh, as he assumes that throne, he wants to stand beside him. He wants to be there with him. And I'm telling you something, friends. We're talking about a man who, gave up, who wants to give up all of his power and make sure that he stands to help that one that deserves it, that God has put in place to be the king. It took something special for that man to be able to do that, and I believe it's love. Can I tell you, that's the kind of love Jesus has for us. Jesus did not have to come and die on a cross for our sins, but I thank God that he did. I thank God that he sacrificed himself, that he gave himself. It's a picture of Jesus' love that he has for his people. See, just as Jonathan laid down everything in his life at the foot of David, Jesus has done that for the children of God. You ought to shout right there and say, thank you, Lord. See, we're nothing but paupers just like old David was. We, we don't deserve the grace of God. We don't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve... Anything that he's done, but he's been so good to us. 
were dressed in rags of sin. And not only were we dressed in rags of sin, but we didn't deserve to be redeemed from those sins. But Jesus did that because he knew nobody, nobody else could do it for us. Oh, honey, I'm telling you something here today. Jesus shows us a relationship very much like the relationship between Jonathan and David as Jonathan looked at David as being not only his friend, but he looked to him as being a close uh, um, uh, uh, Confidant to him. He loved him with all of his heart Can I tell you that the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ goes far deeper than the relationship that Jonathan had with David Honey, I'm gonna tell you what Jesus loves you in spite of you in spite of me, Jesus loves me. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know what that's doing for you, but it's helping me this morning just to know that in spite of who I am, that Jesus loves me anyway. We're nothing more than paupers. We are, we are wretched. We are, I mean, we're just in a bad place. We, without Jesus, we're in a bad place. But I'm telling you, because of Jesus, he put us on a robe of righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Look at somebody say, I'm dressed in the robe of righteousness. He forgave me of my sins. I, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have to stand before him one day and take an account for that which was in my past. But rather, I'm going to stand before him in a robe of righteousness and claim that he is Lord of Lord and King of King in my life and, and throughout eternity. Oh, hallelujah. I'm about to have myself a fit up here this morning. Glory to God. You see, that relationship that Jonathan had with David was one that was deep. It was committed. It was, it was an unadulterated love. It was one that he stood beside this man. He knew that one day God had called him to the place of authority to stand for Israel, to be the leader, to be the king, to sit on that throne. And he says, I don't want to get in the way of nothing that God's doing. I just want to help you get there. Boy, you're talking about a relationship, a love relationship. Not only was it unconditional love for Jonathan, but second thing I want you to think about, it was an uncomplicated love. The uncomplicated love of Jonathan. Let's look at verse number one. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. See, according to verse number one, Jonathan's love for David was just... Uh, uh, was 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 knit. He was knit to uh, to the uh, to to David. In other words, he bound himself to him. He was tied to David, and he even said that he loved him even as his own soul. You see, the prince loved the pauper, and his soul was knit to him. The soul of David. The word knit means to tie or to bind together. See, this is a clear picture of God's grace for us. Can I tell you that when we accept him as Lord and Savior, we are knit to Jesus Christ. In other words, we are bound to him. We are tied to him. We become a part of who he is, and he becomes a part of who we are. He comes and lives inside of our soul, and he redeems us from our sins. I'm going to tell you, it's very much like the relationship that Jonathan had with David where he said that he was knit to him, and he loved him as his own soul. Can I remind you this morning that Jesus knit himself to you? When you accepted him as Savior, he bound himself to you. Boy, that ought to excite you this morning. I'm glad that I'm bound to Jesus Christ. It is a picture of being tied together. It's a clear picture of the grace of God. It's the portrait of how we are loved by Jesus Christ. His love for us is not based on our worth or our merits. You hear what I said? His love for us is not based on our worth or our merits. In other words, Jesus says, in spite of who you are, I still love you. Hallelujah. I'm just going to talk about me for a minute. I mess it up a lot of times. Yes, I do. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. I mess it up a lot of times, but Jesus says, in spite of you, I still love you. You can't make me stop loving you. See, Jonathan was knit to David. He loved him, and no, no matter what was going on, he loved him. But the love that Jesus has for us is far-reaching. 
It is deeper than anything that we can even comprehend. It is a, uh, his love is a, uh, a wonderful love. His love is a primary love. Let's look and see what John uh, says in uh, chapter number 4 and verse number 10. Here's what he says. And this is love, not that we lo uh, loved God, but that we lo but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Can I tell you in that verse of scripture, it was not us that, 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 uh, uh, um, that, that formed that love, but yet it was Jesus who formed that love in us. I want you to look at not only is it a primary love, but it is also a, a perpetual love. Look in verse number 13, or, or excuse me, verse number 3 of Jeremiah 31. The Bible says, The Lord has appeared of old time. Oh, to me, saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Can I tell you, it is a love that where we are drawn to him. See, the love of God has, uh, has uh, far-reaching abilities. It, it draws us to him. I'm grateful for that love. Then I want you to look at it. It's a proven love. See, the love that God has for us is a proven love. Look at verse number 8 of Romans chapter number 5. Here's what the Bible says. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can I tell you this here? It's a proven love. It's not just lip service. Jesus didn't just come down here and say, you know what? I love you. Serve me. That's not what he done. As a matter of fact, here's what he did. He shed his blood. He proved it to us that he loved us. See, Jonathan proved his love to David by standing beside him all the way to the throne of Israel. You hear what I'm telling you this morning? Jesus stood beside us all the way to the foot of the cross of Calvary. Oh, hallelujah. You're talking about a heavenly father. You're talking about a good God. I'm telling you this morning that he loves us. God knew that we could not, we could never love him like, uh, 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 like he loves us, but he loves us anyway. Can I tell you even, I, I can't love God the way he loves me. I'm trying every day to get better at this. I hope you're trying every day to get better at loving God. But I'm telling you this morning, God loves us far more than we love him. And then the third thing I want you to think about is an unconditional love of Jonathan. The unconditional love of Jonathan. Look at verse number three. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. See, this verse tells us that Jonathan loved him as his own soul soul. See, along the way there were hurdles that developed which could uh, have derailed the relationship. See, for instance, Saul hated David. It came to a point where he began to hate David and, rep and repeatedly tried to kill him. You know, he, he tried to destroy him because he knew that David was going to be the next guy taking the throne. He was going to have to overtake Saul in order to do that. So he was trying to destroy David. And that could have derailed the relationship that he had with Jonathan, but it didn't. As a matter of fact, Jonathan stuck close to David in the midst of those trials and stuck close to him in the midst of those struggles. Can I tell you this morning, that's what Jesus does for us. When the devil's trying to kill us, he's our protection. He's our shield. He's our confidant. He is our everything when the devil's trying to destroy us. You see, things got heated up between David and Saul, and, and David was oftentimes the target of hatred. But Jonathan projected love back to his friend. When the world hates you, you listen to what I'm about to tell you. As the world hates you, remember that Jesus loves you. As the world hates you, remember that you are knit to a heavenly father, the one who created all things, and the world does hate you. They hate Christians. And the reason they hate Christians is because they're rejecting the God that we serve. It's not so much about you or I. It's not so much about us. It's about the God that we worship that they hate. So therefore, you become the target of their aggression. But just remember this. While they hate you, Jesus loves you. And he stands for us. See, our soul 
when knit to Jesus is bound for eternity. Again, uh, this is a picture of the kind of love uh, which God loves us. His love for us is not affected by our behavior. You hear what I'm telling you? God's love for us is not affected by our behavior. Now, God doesn't like some of our behaviors. That's for sure. I mean, God rejects some of our behaviors, but that doesn't stop him from loving us. It's, he's, he, his love for us is not affected by his feelings. He doesn't change his feelings toward us. You see, Jonathan did not change his feelings toward his friend David, and he followed him all the way to the throne. God will not change because of his feelings toward us. He doesn't like some of the things that we do, maybe some of the sin that we participated in, but that doesn't change the very idea of how he loves us. His love is never ending, and it's unconditional. You ought to thank the Lord this morning. We've got an unconditional loving Father. Amen. Yes, we do. I'm telling you this morning, he is an unconditional loving Father. When we mess it up, I'm just going to talk about it from my heart this morning. When I jack it up real good, and I've done it many times, God says, I'm not pleased with what you did, that that doesn't change how much I love you. You hear what I'm telling you? And because of that understanding of this, I want to get it right. I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to live in a way that's going to be contrary to the grace of God that he's given to me in my life. I want to live, I want to do it in such a way to where I can project back the love that he is loving me with. Listen to me, folks. Jesus loves you, and it's, his love's not affected by our, his feelings or uh, toward us. It's not affected by our behavior. As a matter of fact, I want you to understand here this morning that Jesus loves you. You see, nothing we did made the Lord start loving us, and nothing we can do will ever make him stop loving us. Hallelujah. Thought about a story. Anybody remember Greg Louganis? Remember he was the great diver, the Olympic diver, and Greg Louganis recorded uh, a story, and he, he talked about a relationship between him and his, his mother. You see, he had great accolades. He um, had uh, won many awards and many uh, different types of medals. He was um, just a phenomenal diver. In 1984, Greg Louganis uh, made a, um, an attempt at a, uh, at a gold medal in the Olympics, excuse me, 1988 in, in the Olympics. And one of the things that he'd done is he went to, and, and you may remember this, he, he did a dive and he hit his head on the springboard and busted it open. Well, they patched him up and he came back and he won the Olympics. He came back and he did some great things and he had all of these different accolades. He had all of these different things and, and, and he recorded this here about what his mother said about him. His mother said, I never come to watch you win, but I come to watch you do what you love to do. Regardless of whether you win or you lose, does it change whether I love you or not? And I thought about that little story and I thought about how that is applied to our life. You see, Jesus wants us to be, he wants us to be successful in the things that we do for his name's sake. He wants us to uh, to draw up near to him and walk in righteousness and holiness. He wants those things to happen. But when we mess up and we fail, God never stops loving us. Now, I don't know how that affects you, but here's how it affects me. When I mess up, I don't have to worry whether or not God still loves me. All I have to do is say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Help me. I'm, I, Lord, I repent in this moment. God, forgive me of what I've done. And, and, and the Lord will always do that because he loves us regardless of what we've done. So when you think about this story of Jonathan and David, you've got to think about it this way here. That relationship that he had between the two of them, their relationship correlates between the relationship that we have with Jesus. See, Jonathan gave up his, everything that he had. He gave it all up to stand beside the man who was going to take the throne of Israel. That's a deep, lasting love. And Jesus gave up heaven to come to here, to this earth, so he could die for you and I. 
And that's love that cannot be explained. Let's all stand to our feet for just a minute.